and then if I can have the con and we can get what get Greetings, Tony Mobley here. Glad to be with you tonight. It's an exciting night. We've had a few bumps and bruises just before we got started. So this is a working lab. This conversation with Tony Mobley is a working lab. And so it's, it's okay that, that we'd have these bumps and bruises. So I wanna say greetings to all of, the, all, all of you who are here presently and those who are watching on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining in tonight's conversation. We have Dr. John Idelson with us tonight, but before we have Dr. Idelson talk to us and share his lab with us, I just wanna share a couple of few moments about why we're here. So again, my name is Tony Mobley, and I thought it was important to have these conversations because there are reasons why the world is in the state that it's in. And so we're using technology for people of all ages to just be able to have conversations, to talk to one another, and maybe break down some of those barriers that separate us. And so I wanted to just start conversations and we've had six great conversations before, and I'm looking forward to number seven, lucky number seven to be a great conversation as well. And so without further ado, we'll talk about our special guest tonight, Dr. John Idelson. And so um, John Idelson is Professor Emeritus of the Information Technology and Community Design, one of the founding members, founding faculty at California State University at Monterey Bay. His area of expertise includes distance and online learning, multimedia development, and e-portfolio issues. Dr. Idelson received his bachelor's degree in radio, television, and film, a master's degree in instructional television, and a PhD in educational psychology and instructional design from Northwestern University. John has taught in the CSU system for over 33 years. First at CSU Chico, and then as the founding faculty member at CSU MB. And so without further ado, Dr. John Idelson, my friend who allows me to call him John. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Dr. Idelson. Yeah, th thank you, Tony. And first, uh, enough of this doctor stuff. I, I spent my whole career having my students just calling me John. It's a conversation and you're doing a conversation. It's much easier to have a conversation when you're on the same level. In fact, the, the story of the being John is that, called John, is that when I first was teaching at Chico, I was uh, assigned a course from a faculty member who was on sabbatical. So I had less than a week to prepare for a course in broadcast law. And it had been a long time since I'd had one of those. So I'm in the library working the first week of, of school and the librarian came up to me and she's, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually studying, preparing. And she said, well, what class? And I told her the name of the class. And she said, this she said, we don't really don't get students here until the third or fourth week of, of the semester. And I said, no, I'm, I'm a faculty member. And she clearly thought I was too young. So that's when I grew the beard. And uh, it was important that uh, I at least looked like an adult, but I didn't want to be called Dr. Dr. Idelson. So at Chico, I was just John. I, I did have a habit of wearing a coat and tie, which was not normal for California faculty members. I came from the Midwest, which was more more formal. But um, anyway, when I came down to Monterey, many years later, 17 years later, I was explaining to one of my friends here how I had grown the beard to look older. And my colleague looked at me and said, you could drop the beard now. But uh, <laughs> at, at, at Monterey, I same thing. It was just just call me john. 
but I would hear the students talking about Dr. Idelson and having an appointment with Dr. Idelson. And I finally confronted him in the hall and said, what, what's this Dr. Idelson stuff? I said, call me John. And they said, well, we're not talking about you. I said, well, who are you talking about? He said, oh, your son, when he comes home from middle school, he you know, waits in your office for an hour before you go home. And we meet with him because he gives us better help on homework and his jokes are nowhere as bad as yours. So, so the real Dr. John in the family or doctor, I should say, is my son, Brendan. Fantastic. So, so John, we want to, um, we want to talk about the lab that you've prepared for us tonight. And I believe you are, you should be a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen if you need to. Okay. Well, actually, the, the lab will be probably easier than that because um, what I really want to talk about is the PORTS project, which is Parks Online for Students and Teachers. And if, uh, let me go into the chat. I assume everybody can see the chat if I put it in. Absolutely. And just make sure that you send it to panelists and attendees, please. Okay. You think I would know how to use this technology? I tried to post a URL earlier and it didn't work. So if you're sharing a URL. Well, how does that work? Ports. Yeah. CSU. That seemed to have come in. Okay. Yep. And let's see if it actually goes to where it's supposed to go. I'll try to launch it on my computer here. And it went there, Parks Online Resources for Students and Teachers. And this is, you know, Professor Emeritus, it means I'm technically retired, although according to my wife, I'm failing retirement. Uh, but a Professor Emeritus gets to keep the title. And it used to be you got a free parking pass, uh, but they've stopped that now. Uh, but you, you do not have to attend faculty meetings. So had I known that earlier, I would have tried to become a professor emeritus much earlier. But um, one of the projects that I continue to work on that I started with at CSU Monterey Bay and is really sort of a follow on from my work at Chico. So uh, CSU Chico or Chico State is one of the 23 campuses in the California State University system there. And I was teaching instructional technology and media production. And there was a lab in the, in the facility there. And the other faculty member who used it the most was a good friend, John Hooper, who taught in the Parks and Recreation Department. And we were the two heaviest users of this lab and our students were because both of us were working on having students create media to make presentations. John was doing it for parks and recreation and primarily interpretation for um, interpreters. He led the campus tours and did media for exhibits and parks. And I was doing it for education and training. So that's where I got my first taste of really being excited about working with both the California State Parks and our city parks, the city of Chico has the largest municipal park in the country. Fast forward to CSU Monterey Bay. I got a phone call one day from a person who had heard that I know a little bit about distance education and teleconferences and chroma key. And they had a chroma key green screen uh, in the basement of the California Capitol. And they were using it for electronic field trips to have legislators talk to uh, schools across California. And the, the state capital is in fact a, a, a state resource, does tours and it's managed by the California State Parks. And that eventually led to creating a green screen studio at Seacliff State Park for electronic field trips to let interpreters present information about the California State Parks to kids all across California and actually all across the world. And one of the equity issues we have in the state is we have students who might only be 10, 20, 30 miles from the ocean, but never saw it. Uh, maybe close to a park, never went to it, or may not be close to a park. So the electronic outreach was try to get the information about the California State Parks in front of as many students as we could. And one of my student projects, we had capstone projects within our 
program, students had to do a senior project. So a number of students did projects helping with safe parks. And one of them was the group that worked on the original green screen studio. And that project eventually has blossomed into this ports, which is the parks online resources for students and teachers. Um, during the pandemic, it was probably some of the best uh, instructional that uh, support that was able to be beamed directly to, to kids in their homes while they're in classrooms. So rather than doing a, uh, a formal um, lab, I just want to you know, let you know about this site. There are videos of some of the um, field trips that our rangers and interpreters have done. Uh, unfortunately, some of the, the things that I get most excited about, we can't show because they're actually direct interactions between an interpreter and a classroom with classroom students interacting and talking to an interpreter and because we don't have the rights to play those videos over YouTube. You can't see them, but you can get a sense of that if you look at the uh, World Ocean Day, which was part of the ports project where we had divers in um, in the kelp forest at Point Lobos, uh, talking to third and fifth graders, uh, answering questions about the starfish and the kelp that were growing in uh, in the state park. So that my uh, lab is to encourage you to take a look at that site. And if you're in California, go to a California state park. Absolutely, thank you, John, for that. I'm gonna ask one of the attendees to post the link to the website in YouTube. And if it does not appear, then we will, we will get it there. Um, and it's an easy one to remember because Parks Online Resources for Students and Teachers, it's, or Teachers and Students, because it spells ports, P-O-R-T-S, and then just dash C-A for California.us. So it's a pretty easy website. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the, the divers? Um, or is that, is that for another conversation? No, no. It, I, I think this sort of does the link between um, uh, what I was doing with ports and how this office hour group, which spawned this conversation, um, it was clear in office hours that audio is very critical. And it has been a real issue with the online education that we did with the park services to get good, clean audio. Uh, we knew classrooms were not uh, acoustically uh, the best location. So it, totally independent of the challenges we had with the divers, we, we were constantly striving to get the best audio from a state park interpreter into a classroom, but even more importantly, how to get a good question and answer session from a classroom. Because if the interpreter can't hear the students asking questions, then the student has to ask the question to the teacher and then the teacher has to ask it. And that makes the conversation harder. The strength of a conversation is I say, hey, Tony, I love the way things are looking. I look at, at uh, Chris Clark, and I, you know, I feel at home because there he is in his office. Uh, John, if you ever change the color of your uh, seat back there, I won't know what to do. You know, there's, <laughs> it, it, you know, this direct, direct communication. So we've always strived to get good audio. And so the fact that uh, um, office hours was pushing that. And at one of the office hours, I was explaining the, the challenges that we had because we were doing our first um, interpretations, um, electronic field trips with divers and the challenge of getting good audio from a diver to a classroom and also getting students to ask back and forth. And I sort of expressed the, uh, the challenge and a fellow office hour, uh, Chris Fenwick said, I've got, I've got the sound, my sound man, Stan. And he introduced me to the Stan Banks and uh, he took this as a, as a challenge. And so he literally designed and built an audio mixing system that lets us get clean audio from divers without the breath noise interrupting the conversation. And um, it was a 
a labor of love, but it came about because of the community. Uh, I was in the community. Chris was at the community. He had a friend in his community. And the next thing you know, we've uh, solved a problem. And it turns out we've solved a problem that really hasn't been solved this way. We've gotten such good feedback from that. Uh, one field trip that we actually have two aquariums wanting to know how we did it. And luckily Stan is. Uh, yeah. You, 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 you beat my next question. Cause I was going to ask, had that been successfully done anywhere else before? Not, not to this level at this price point. And, and a lot of it is just, you know, the technology has changed so much. Um, my first teleconference was using a technology called slow scan TV. Uh, probably the best way to describe it. If those remember Polaroid film, you took a picture and you had to wait 30 seconds as it developed, and then you would pull it out. You might think of it like TV over fax because the fax has to play before the picture comes out. So back in, um, I think it was in 77, 76, 77, we were doing experimentation with RCA GlobeSat as the communication link and doing some instruction from the Chicago Medical School to the US Navy. In this case, it was a ship halfway between San Diego and Hawaii. So, you know, we're selling slow scan video, marginal audio, but that was my first uh, professional video teleconference. So the technology has gotten better, the cost has gotten lower. And um, I think in this last year, uh, just lots of things happened that made it easier for us to be able to develop a piece of hardware. Uh, I know that um, the national parks set up an audio system at Channel Islands, uh, I think almost 12 years ago. And that probably cost about 20 times what it cost for us to do what Stan was able to build with uh, the, today's technology. That's really fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for you and for other uh, libraries and museums and other park uh, uh, facilities that will be able to utilize what you guys have put together. So again, well, as our, to our park interpreter and divers say, you know, we've, there are, you know, we talk about going back to the moon, but there's lots of places right on this little ball of ours that we haven't explored. Over 70% of the ocean, uh, Earth is ocean, and we're only seeing the top of it. And here at Monterey Bay, we have the one of the deepest canyons in, um, in the uh, Pacific. And uh, it's, it's amazing what the wildlife is deep in the ocean and how critical it is to the health of the planet. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Uh, we're going to go to our questions now. Uh, and my friend Talak is doing double duty tonight. He's doing questions and cutting. And so um, I'm going to reach out to some of my, my other office hour members who, who are here if you want to help Talak out so he doesn't have to do double duty. Let him know and, and we'll, we'll get it done. So we'll just go with the first question. Um, our first question tonight is from Tony Mobley. Can you share how you think COVID-19 has affected instruction of students for the future? Yeah, it, it's a, a good question. The, the first thing is whenever you ask about the future, it's hard to, uh, to make that uh, discussion. My father, who, uh, who's the one who taught me how to fail retirement, he worked as a civilian uh, for 52 years. So his retirement was basically working for the Air Force. And, um, he joked because he was a, a physicist, became an electrical engineer, and I never quite knew what he did until his retirement party, because a lot of the work he did was, I guess, secret, but he, he did work with early GPS. He was the one who actually built the, and designed the rescue radio that was used in World War II. So he did some interesting projects, and in his later years, I, I said, you know, you know, what do you do? And he said, well, I used to be an engineer, but now I'm a paper pusher. Um, uh, but one of his jobs was actually long-term planning, you know, what, what's going to be in the future and what technologies do we have to have that part of the work he did GPS. And so after he retired, I said, well, tell me what you, you know, about long-term planning, what do I need to know? And he said, well, so I used to really think about long-term planning, but at my age, my long-term planning is what am I going to have for lunch? 
And uh, my other story with planning is that at, at one point, um, in fact, it was early on, I was doing a project with ISDN, which is a precursor to digital communication for phone lines. We used to do video conferencing over ISDN lines. And we did a project with Pacific Bell in between two schools and we were hooking up all the equipment. Uh, my son at this point, I think was in fifth grade. And as he's watching me hook it up and we're explaining what's happening, um, my, my son said, wait a second. I mean, I could be at home and be at school from, from this. And, and I said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could, but that's that, you know, it, it's not gonna happen soon, you know, tariffs and all sorts of technology. And I could see, you know, still a little kid, I could see his sort of tearing up because, you know, he wanted to do it. I told him, you can't do that. And I said, Brendan, you're going to be able to do it in the future. And he, and he says, you know, oh, but I want to do it now. And his younger sister turned to Brendan and said, don't worry, Brendan, the future is coming faster now. And that comment stuck with me. Now, there's other comments that my daughter made that have stuck with me that are not as pleasant, but that, that particular comment stuck with me in that the future is coming faster now. Uh, I, I think we're very fortunate to have been where I was at the time that I was because I was promoting technology and education and training when it really wasn't the main, main course. You know, lots of times I would do workshops and presentations and here's the guy with the cool new tech, the interactive video disc or the video conferencing. <laughs> But it's, you know, don't worry, it's not going to affect us. Well, I got out of the biz, you know, and now a lot of my friends go, remember all that stuff you said it was going to work? It was miserable. It, it doesn't work. You know, you said how great it was going to be. Um, but it, it takes a long time for technology to uh, have an influence, an impact. Uh, a number of us in this room here probably have seen the overhead projector uh, and saw it in classes. But the, the, the technology, the overhead projector that lets you write on a sheet of plastic and have it projected on a screen behind you and look directly to your students, that started in bowling alleys. It took over 20 years for it to get from bowling alleys to classroom use. And here we are with uh, Alex talking about the Telestrator or the e-light board is trying to solve the same thing. How do you write on something, show it to students and still keep good eye contact? So, um, Predicting the future is, is hard, but uh, I think there are certain events that change the course of the future. And I think the, the changes are really, although they feel very impactful at the time, I think the immediate impact is much less than the long-term impact. Uh, and if you look at the technologies that were developed during World War II, you look at the technologies that were developed during the space race, um, a, a technology that was used to hold things together called Velcro that was developed, you know, primarily for in, during the space mission, you know, changes the way we dress kids. My daughter, you know, has a new, uh, new, we have a new grandson and, and she loves Velcro. I mean, it's the best thing for changing diapers. <laughs> that probably wasn't the intent of the NASA scientists when they developed Velcro. Uh, so, and you can tell I'm a professor because I'm taking a long way to get to the point. But the question is, if I recall, um, you know, what will the impact of, of COVID-19 be on the future? And I think um, what happened with the COVID experience in schools was proving that schools can change rapidly, do things differently, and not completely fall apart. Now, some people may feel that they fell apart, but when you think about it, it's pretty amazing how we were able to continue to function in educational settings. Clearly, there were a lot of inequities in terms of access to technology. There were a lot of students who did not do as well, but there were also students who did, did very well. But the fact that the system did not completely shut down and it meant that we've exposed to a lot more teachers. You know, you, you teacher education, whether it you know, be your track to become a college professor or to be a, an elementary school teacher, you have to go through your whole years of schooling, 
which sort of indoctrinate you in that model. And then if you're in teacher prep, it might be one or two years after your undergraduate degree. But then you have years of in the classroom, but you tend to repeat or tend to follow the models that you, you use when you learn. So um, a lot of the new innovations in technology happen with the younger or newer teachers who are just coming into the field. Well, there wasn't a teacher who didn't get exposed to new options and technologies that they could use in their classroom after this year. And I think that's opened the eyes, eyes to a lot of uh, school administrators, teachers, parents, and to the kids. And now that those options are there, it's going to be hard to put that bottle back or that genie back in the bottle. I was going to say that bottle back in the genie, but the genie is right. probably happy drinking from the bottle after he got out. But anyway. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. Laura, you had a, a, a you wanted to say something? I actually popped it in chat, but thank God the CMS has replaced the old purple mimeographs. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I, I still miss, you know, when they pass out those sheets and you could smell it. You have to be gray beards like us to know the, uh, the smell of mimeograph. I have a story for you later, John. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's go to the next question. The next question is also from Tony. What are your suggestions for moving forward for the classroom instruction? Um, a, a good question. And I think it's, it's different for the different um, segments, whether it's the K-12 community or higher ed or actually a whole area where education and training takes place in business and industry where actually more money and time and effort is sometimes spent in the uh, professional training field fields than in our uh, public or private educational systems. But um, it, it's not a technology problem. It really is uh, social constructs and, and what are our beliefs about the, the value of an educational, an education to an individual and what is the responsibility of government, families, society in general to educate um, their youth, which is the, uh, the greatest resource I think that we have. And um, you know, we have some places around the world where don't, we don't have equity in terms of education access for men versus women. We have areas around the world that there aren't enough adults to be, have teachers at the same class ratio that we have here of, you know, and we complain about, you know, one teacher with 28 to 32 students uh, in the classroom. There are places where you couldn't get those numbers because you just don't have enough adults. So I think the real question around um, what needs to happen is we need to really get those discussions of what is the purpose and the value of education? And then how do we um, do the political, you know, have the political will and the resources to you know, make that a priority? And uh, I, I'm an educator, so I'm biased, but I think the investment that we make in our youth in education pays off considerably. And if we don't do it when kids are young and they're growing up and are like sponges gathering information, if we don't pay the cost, and it is a cost of time and money and effort to educate kids. I've got two of them. I could tell you the cost. Um, but if we don't do that, we're going to pay for it later in different ways, whether it be incarceration or in terms of last lost productivity for a society. And so those are real educational issues I see. You know, whether we have good audio or not or enough bandwidth, although enough bandwidth is critical. But uh, th those are the bigger questions than, you know, how do we implement technology or learn from the technology experiment we did during the COVID year? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, John, for that. Um, I, 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 I just want, I, before we go to the next question, I was just thinking, do you think that not so much what we're doing here right now, but in terms of the, the office our model 
of having conversations around the learning and project-based learning needs to be pushed more in the school systems? Well, it, anything that has to be pushed is hard. You know, it's like pushing spaghetti. It's not going to be easy. Um, Project-based learning has been around for a long time. And very early on in my academic career, I realized that the, I got the best work out of my students when the work that they did was seen by people other than just me. Uh, if, I, if it was going to be public in some way, we, my students did public service announcements in our production class. Uh, when we were teaching computer-aided instruction, we were usually doing it for another classroom. If they knew their work was just going to be seen by me with a check mark on it, it wasn't the same effort than if their work was going to be seen by somebody else. And the other thing I learned is that if that somebody else was their fellow students, even more work and effort went into it. So um, a lot of the work that I did with electronic portfolios, which is one of my interests, is how do we document student learning? And lots of times we document it by you give the person a test and you got an 80 or 90 or 70 and that's on a board. Um, CSU Monterey Bay wanted to be and is pretty close to it to be an outcomes-based campus where it, the outcome wasn't you got a grade because you got a 92 on this test. The output was that you created a network for a halfway house using your technology skills that you learned in class. It was a product a project that you did. And it was not only that you were able to do it technologically, but you were able to document it and you were able to explain it to others. And so, you know, problem-based uh, learning or project-based learning is something that very early on, I realized was the best way for me to get the best work out of my students, which I, you know, I think that is a, a role, the responsibility of a faculty member to your enthusiasm for your subject is not only because you like it, but that enthusiasm is hopefully caught by your students and some of them decide this is something they want to pursue or they want to get better at. So the and project-based learning isn't necessarily harder to do, but it's different and it changes the workflow of what the teacher does and what the student does um, and how we document it and how we measure it. And I think, at least in the U.S., we've gotten caught in uh, this um, let, leave no child left untested. Uh, they, and we somehow got the misunderstanding that reading, writing, and arithmetic were the only things that count. So I look at Turlock there and, and go, um, you know, opera isn't reading, writing, and arithmetic. But if you don't, you have to know reading, writing, and arithmetic, and you, you have to figure out how much power that light grid is going to take. And there's the music and the, the creativity, and there's knowing history, all these other things. And history, we've, we've, storytelling, uh, music, yeah, the, aesthetics, uh, ex expression, dance. Um, and I think that's where we sort of lost our way because. Um, we, you, we, we try to in STEM where we've added, you know, it, uh, arts to STEM and music and things. But, but I think that's, that's the, the challenge. And project-based learning, problem-based learning, whatever you want to call it, tends to work better in broader contexts, like producing a play, building a bridge, uh, figuring out how to uh, get better drainage in a park or like one school to the project-based learning on how to reduce the water use on their playground. Those things can teach the basics, but they teach so much more. But um, since you can't say that this class is in the 90th percentile and it's math on fifth grade, which seems to be how we want to measure success when we're dealing the funding, you know, how many, how many kids got promoted, how many people um, 
met the state standards, uh, then there's a disconnect. And I think what happens is good intentions of the leave no child left untested was that we were dealing with inequity issues where we had some students who were terribly below their grade level because the resources and the intentions, the attention to learning had not been done in those communities. And we had other communities that had, you know, college prep, arts classes. So there was a discrepancy. And the only way you could know that discrepancy is do some measurements. And then when you do those measurements, you try to, to improve them. But we ended up missing the point because the discrepancies weren't only just in the classroom. There were so many other discrepancies and we really haven't leveled the field for our students across the country here in the US and in the world. Thank you, John. Next question. Lou Perez asks, what tools would you recommend for teachers and students to enhance remote learning? Uh, okay. Um, there, for students and teachers, um, you know, for teachers, I think more of some of the presentation tools and uh, whether it be getting good at um, Keynote or PowerPoint or um, trying to think about some of the other Prezi presentations. So there's, there's some things that teacher tools that are specific that will help teachers create better presentations. There are also some productivity tools that make it easier for teachers to keep track of their students' work. Um, make sure that you're, you're not losing students who, because you, know, you don't know what, where they are within their uh, learning journey. Uh, I think for students, it's um, life productivity schools, <laughs> basically a calendar that you use, a, do, a to-do list that you use, and getting good at learning the, the tools, technology tools that help expand your power, whether it be learning how to do a better search uh, through Google or Zoom, uh, learning how to um, essentially cut and paste, save things, do record keeping. Uh, we, we talk about our uh, digital natives. And so there's, this, I think, a misconception that uh, because we have students who use technology a lot, whether it be watching YouTube or TikTok, that they're great at digital. But a lot of times uh, the students may be good at using their device, you know, knowing how to operate it, but that doesn't mean they're great at using the power that digital tools give you, like a, a lever gives you greater uh, leverage to move a boulder. Um, you know, I've known a lot of students who, didn't know how to uh, use Excel spreadsheets to, you know, do a per chart to plan a project. So they weren't always, per, you know, doing their work at the last minute. Um, but, uh, students, you know, didn't know how to use calendars to, uh, you know, give them prompts. Uh, I, I would teach students you know, with my syllabus. A lot of my syllabus was, here's what we're going to try to cover. Here's the pace that we're going to try to do it. But for me to work at this pace, getting that information to you, you have to be working with me at that same pace. So let's let's sync our calendars like we sync our clocks. And I was amazed at how many students really didn't have that sort of conceptual plan of how a, a calendaring tool could help them academically, planning for papers, for when they're going to study, when they're going to turn things in. So those are the tools that I would, would focus on. It, it kind of sounds to me like, like you're also talking about, uh, you know, consumption versus production in terms of the way in which um, our youth and young people use their devices too. It's, it's, it's all about consuming and not producing anything. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. Next question. Our next question is also from Lou Perez. Any tips you can recommend for educators to get students comfortable and more engaged in remote education? Um, one of the, the, the best icebreakers that I did with a uh, remote and distance learning class was um, 
sending each of the participants, sending or the, the couple times I've done this, I've just said, this is what you need to get. Did it with a graduate seminar. And the opening graduate seminar, I said, okay, take out your box of crayons, your sheet of paper, scissors and glue. And I said, you were gonna have 20 minutes. You got, I had them get a legal size sheet of paper or a larger set of paper. And using the crayons, the scissors, any other things you've got around you, uh, you need to create an image of who you are and what you hope to gain from this course without any words. And I would wow. say that there's a fair amount of um, gnashing of teeth. You know, I, wait, I signed up for a graduate course. I, for it worked out best when I sent them a box and told them they couldn't open the box until the class started. And they're, you know, here we're taking this high tech class and we got this box and it rattles and they open it up and there's a roundy pointed scissors, a glue stick, glitter and things like that. And, um, and there was a lot of, you know, what is this? And, and <laughs> I went to know this, this is what it really is. And as they're doing it, there were some of them were complaining and they were saying, well, you know, why are we doing it? Should we do this? And we're talking through it, but I said, this is what we're going to do. So eventually they would create something. And then after this creation was done, they would hold it up. And then the rest of the audience, like, you know, charades would have to say, you know, who is this person and what their goal was. And um, I, I should say I did this before, not in a distance learning course, I did it in a real live graduate seminar. And in the graduate seminar, we did all this. And then at the end of, and we put them up on the wall. And at the end of the class period, I cleaned off all the walls, like, you know, professor should do making the room. And I threw them in the trash because it, it had met my goal. You know, we, we had done it, we used it. And the hate I got from my students, you know, you're throwing away my work. I said, this is the work you complained about when I started the class. <laughs> you know, so every time in that class, I saved it. And then at the end of the term, we put them back up and it was sort of a good bookend. Then when I tried this online, it was even better. It was even better. Exactly. Um, and what it did is it had them doing something that was not in their comfort zone that let them show different parts of their personality and not everybody loved it. I mean, there was really some grumpy people, you know, you, you could, Chris could probably relate every once in a while you'll get a grumpy student. Um, but having a part of that class, which was totally interaction in an area where nobody was any better than, well, I wouldn't say that there were some really people, I did a graduate class once and there was a, a ringer. This was a person who did scrapbooking with her kids. You know, so by the time she was done, we all gave up, you know, we didn't you know, show anything, but, but other than that <laughs> one, um, because in, in any class, I, I'm, and it's not, I think as, as much in, in the K-12 space, but that, that may just be my ignorance that I'm showing because I think you, you've got a little bit of a, a broader window. But in a university setting where you're on a semester or quarters where you only have maybe nine or 12 weeks and you maybe only have a two hour first session, a lot of the chemistry of that whole class is determined in that first session that you have. And lots of times that tends to be a teacher reading a syllabus and talking at the students. Right. And that sets a, a, a constraint that's hard to change. So this experiment where the the start of the class really wasn't diving into the subject but was letting people talk with each other express some of their interests and let other people know who they were made a big difference and i think i think that's sort of fun things that with the office hour uh experiment that i'd like you to see and i see what you're doing is sort of doing something i think would be great because we're just having a conversation i mean i'm we're really not as much as one I'd like. I'd like to be talking less. I feel like my old lecturing days. But well, I, John, I want to know you, more about uh, the, the people uh, that are here than hearing me talk. Well, the 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 panel can raise their hand, and and I'm probably not. 
I, I'm working on being a better host. Part of my problem is that when you're when you're sharing your information, I get enthralled in 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 what you're saying, and I should be jumping in, but I'm listening and I'm nodding my head, and and so I apologize to you. I've, I've you know well, I've done no this. No apologies, but just like John raised your hand, I'd like to hear what John has. So I look at Jim there. I think of Jim's career, and we've talked about the other things. You, you learn more. I I learn more listening than I do teaching, talking. And I think my students learn more when they talk than when they listen to me. But John, you got your hand up. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm enjoying listening to what you have to say. This is, this is very fascinating stuff. And I, while I do have some background in education and that I got a teaching certificate many decades ago, uh it's it's just you have much more practical experience than me you you have uh you know a, a lot more background and and listening to what you have to say i find very interesting so i would well, rather I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'd i'm rather, not dead yet i'd rather remain silent and look wise than to talk and remove all doubt <laughs> yeah, no, I've, and there got that t-shirt <laughs> john all of us uh uh think that sometimes so that's fine if anybody else wants to to uh i can't quite see everybody yet that's something that i'm working on failing forward but if you if you have if you want to interject please raise your hand and i'll scroll through and and see if i can can see your hand um and if no one else has any comments we're going to go to the next question The next question is from Liberty White. As, children's and, as children and parents prepare to return to school, what parts of the past year of virtual learning should we maintain? I, I think if there's one thing I'd like, where it was successful, um, to retain the fact that parents were actively engaged in observing and participating with their students' learning. And it doesn't have to only be, you know, via Zoom that you do that. And I think that uh, was a change that 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 in my community that I saw the most. Where um, sometimes uh, the K twelve space is not as um, open to parents' involvement. You know, the schools may complain that the kids only parents only show up for PTA meetings and the sports games. But sometimes I don't think the schools are as welcoming. Uh, I know that I did a lot of work with my kids when they were in kindergarten, but by first grade, the teachers was, you know, let's get this weird college faculty member out of here. Um, so I think the, what I see as a, a, one of the positive outcomes of this was that um, talking with parents about not realizing, you know, what was being taught, how it was being taught, what the teachers were going through. So I think. It, parent engagement uh, is probably something that I hope will continue, uh, even though the classrooms, you know, may be not virtual, but the parents still can check the kids' homework, uh, can keep up with their learning, and I, I hope that that uh, continues. Fantastic. Thank you, Liberty, for that question. Um, next question. The next question is, from me, <laughs> uh, what is the what is the most rewarding interaction as an educator that you have ever had? Um, one of the advantages of being uh, retired and emeritus, which means you've had a lot of students, and uh, there's a number of rewarding uh, events. Uh, one from a near, number of years ago was when I got a phone call from a, uh, uh, well, Bank of America. They were hiring their head of, um, of uh, education and training. And lots of times I would get calls from companies going, do you have some students, you know, we're, we're hiring an entry level position or we're, we want an intern. So I got the call from the HR department. And, and um, at that point, I just moved down to Monterey. Uh, I, ran the uh, 
graduate program in instructional technology at Chico, which was a master's program. But at CSU Monterey Bay, I was teaching in our teledramatic arts. I was teaching in our computer science. And so I didn't have the same access that I had to students. And, and so I was, you know, the, the recruiter that I knew, I said, look, I'm, I'm on a new campus. I, I don't have my graduate students anymore. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to help you. And he said, oh, I, I'm not looking for an intern. I want a, a, a reference. And uh, it was a reference for one of my former students. And wow. uh, I, I said, oh, yeah, she was great. You know, it'd be wonderful. You know, what are you thinking about? And she said, well, we're thinking of making her head of the department. I go, what do you mean? She can't be head of the department. You know, she was still the 22-year-old who graduated. <laughs> she was now more than that and had become head of the Bank of America training group. And so I think when you see your students succeed, um, it's a lot of fun. One of the, the another sort of, uh, reward as a faculty member, uh, the student whose capstone project was working on the green screen studio now works at Zoom, putting in classrooms and Zoom rooms, uh, working for Zoom in their group that specializes in supporting and designing uh, facilities. So to see your students not only exceed, but excel beyond your uh, you, you, what you taught them, you know, uh, and probably the most recent one was a student who I just connected in on Facebook and he, he was a challenge. In fact, the, the students who are the greatest challenge sometimes are the greatest reward. And this, he was a student. Oh, how, I mean, he must be, must've been 20, 27 years ago. And we just connected on Facebook and, uh, and I sort of said, why, why, what made you reach out? He says, well, I was feeling guilty for all the grief I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, in hindsight, you know, when you kept on saying this is important and you'll understand it at some time. And he, and he said, I didn't think that was true. You were right. And that's probably the greatest, you know, reward that you get somebody that, you know, says, yeah, you were right. And I'm going to say, John, that, that I'm sure that there are a whole lot of other thank yous that you just haven't heard yet. But um, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're going to continue on. Um, we, we typically go for an hour, but since we've done the Dr. Chris Clark reformatting, we do our project in the beginning. So we will be going until 930 Eastern Standard Time. I'm easy. All right. So our next question is. Laura Thompson asks, <clears throat> if you were given God mode for the day, <laughs> what is one change you would make to education? That's well, Laura, thank you for the question. And I would say, if I were given God mode for a day, the change I would make on would be that eating chocolate caramels would not put weight on you. I just, you know, I mean, I would like to do education, but it, if you're giving me that opportunity, <laughs> let, let's, let's get real about it. Um, it but no, I'm serious. Uh, I think if there were a change I could make in education would be the deal with the inequity. Um, uh, I was a, a co-parenting, but primary single dad for a, a long time in my kids, you know, when, when you're a single parent, you got two kids, there, there are more of them than there are of you. And we'd always get into fights about who could sit in the front seat longest. And, and when the kids were little, you know, you know, the, my daughter, or my son would say, that's not fair. And I say, this has nothing to do with fair. Yeah. And I, I gave what was called the fairness lecture. I said, you know, has nothing to do with fair. If life were fair, we would be hungrier. We would be poor. We, you know, we, you, you don't want fair because, you know, life isn't fair. And if it were fair, you probably wouldn't have liked the way you have it because we're privileged. Um, and then they would usually shut up because they didn't want to listen to the fairness lecture from their father. Hmm. So when I married Bobby, um, adding a new 
member to our family, you know, the kids started regressing to the fighting who could sit in the front seat and who would sit next to who and who was in there. And as they were fighting all at once, I, I just said, fairness lecture. And they stopped fighting. They solved it and they got in the car. And Bobby looked at me and said, what just happened? I said, well, I was, you know, they were fighting. They were being kids. They were talking about things being fair. And um, I just said the fairness lecture, sort of shorthand for my lecture that I normally gave him about fairness. And she, she looked at me like, this is amazing. What's the fairness lecture? And I said, well, I, you know, clearly they wanted to avoid it. So I'm not going to give it. Um, Sarah, why don't you tell Bobby what the fairness lecture is? And she was nine and a half at the time. I think probably the last time I gave the full 40 minute fairness lecture to my kids, she was four. And she gave this incredibly articulate <laughs> answer, wow. much better than my lecture ever was about fairness and equity. And um, so it had been matured way beyond my, you know, darn it, kids, stop, stop bothering me. Um, so if there was something that I could do in a godlike mode, would try to deal with the issue with equity and fairness. Um, I'm talking wow. of a number of students, some of the students that I um, feel that I've, I wish I could have done more were students who had not been prepared properly to really be competitive in, in the university. And there's only so much you can do in your classes. Um, and so I think uh, if we could make it so that kids don't come to school hungry, that they have caring adults um, and that we have um, equity, then that would be what I would do if I had that power. Thank you, John. That was that was powerful. Um, well, if you wow. didn't like it, I'm going to give you the fairness lecture. <laughs> oh boy! Um, well, next question. The next question is from Tony. What are your suggestions for pro professional development for educators? Well, th this is an interesting thing. My start in the academy was I was managing a, uh, a learning center for a college of education. And the dean I worked for, Claude Mathis, he eventually was the chair of my PhD committee. Uh, I claim that you know, although my work was in industrial engineering and, and psychology, that his real job was to turn me into a Southern gentleman, which was hard because I was a Yankee. He was a Texan. But uh, we would do these technology workshops because I was the tech guy. We were had porta packs, the original videotape recorders that called porta packs, but they were size of sewing machines and little black and white images on tape. Um, we would do these workshops for the faculty, and we would be designing them together, and they were called technology workshops. And but Claude and I would get together, and he said, "You know, these faculty members." have PhDs, some of them are Nobel scholars, you know, they're not gonna come to get instructed on how to teach. And he says that most of them can't teach their way out of a paper bag. They're willing to come here to learn about technology because they think they don't know about technology. So our goal is to use the technology training in this professional development to teach better pedagogy. And that was the sort of focus. And that's when I started realizing that we, we could use technology as a carrot, but we could sneak in good teaching practices. And um, probably some of the most influential research that I read was the research that was done with early online education, when there was a great deal of resistance. And um, I'm going to I'm going to mess up on who the authors were. So I won't, if anybody wants to know it, I'll pull out the study. I should remember, but essentially they did a lot of research on the instruction that was done online. Cause the, at that time there's a 
online learning was less uh, quality, less effective, you know, all these things, it was terrible and you shouldn't use it. So they did all this research, they gathered completion rates, they gathered, you know, the typical evaluation of a course is you ask the students, do they like it at the end, you know, the, the uh, student evaluations. Um, but there was a lot of data gathered and there were some, you know, good signs. There were some bad signs, but the university that did this research had all this data on their online students. And um, at that point, the president said, well, how does this compare to our face-to-face -face training? And they said, um, we don't have this much data on our face-to-face -face training. You know, we don't interview our students every week in the face-to-face -face training we haven't looked at their work to see if they completed it. So the, the president said, well, let's apply the same metrics that you just did on this evaluating the online courses to our face-to-face -face courses. And they did that study. And the amazing thing that they found and a lot of, you know, typically when you do research, you don't get amazed. You have an idea, maybe it's researcher bias, but you're not, you're not just, you know, walking down the street and going, oh, I just discovered that. No, you're sort of looking for it. So the amazing thing they found out that the online versus face-to-face -face was not a critical factor in the quality or the success of the students. It was the quality of the design of the course and the skills of the teacher. So it didn't matter whether they were doing it online. If you were a good teacher in a face-to-face -face classroom, you were probably a very good teacher in an online classroom. And if you were a miserable teacher in the face-to-face, -face, you were probably even more of a miserable one in the online. So I think the professional development should really be honing our skills on being better teachers. And in that case, it's learning how to motivate students, learning how to assess their learning, how to get the pulse, just like, you know, try to get the pulse of the audience. You know, uh, when I had, when I drew the short straw and had the large lecture class, you know, it wasn't that hard to realize when you lost the students, you, you would see the eyes going down. <laughs> Some of my classes even fell asleep probably. Um, so the professional development should be made to, to help us become better communicators and educators. And it doesn't have to be about the technology. It, doesn't, it, it may be we use the technology because, you know, if you get a faculty member to come to a professional development workshop because you're going to give them a new computer, that's great. And they come there because they want a new computer because typically in the old days, we didn't get a new computer as a faculty member for every four or five years. But the, the real professional development is to make yourself a better teacher. and you know, when I finished my PhD and I was a young Turk, you know, I thought I was pretty good. It, you know, it, I found myself 10 years into it, apologizing to my, to my current class about dumb things I told my previous class. <laughs> I used to, I taught a lot of educational psychology and training courses. And then after I had children, boy, did that change my lectures. You know, get, get, get a little real data in your belt and then you go, mm, yeah, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that. Next question. Um, Shane Foley asks a long question, so hopefully I can get it right here. Hi, John. I appreciate the problems you've previously cited regarding learning management systems, especially as they've been implemented at the tertiary level. If not via LMS, how do you see the future of online or distance education? And what web-based tools will we need to bring to this vision, bring this vision to life? Thank you. Okay, yeah, I, for those of you who haven't heard me on office hours, there are these things called learning management systems, course management systems, WebCT, Blackboard, uh, Moodle, um, whose lineage really started with, uh, you know, becoming sort of a bulletin board where students and faculty could exchange documents that you normally would have handed out in class. Uh, they, they weren't ever really um, originally conceived in a way of 
uh, their turning their their title learning management or course management. So um, I don't have a great re regard for uh, those tools, but primarily that they've been been misused and. Um, my research that I've done in electronic portfolios is connected with this in that where learning management systems tend to be very faculty centric. It was how does the faculty member put their syllabus up? How does the faculty member give the schedule? How does the faculty member collect work? How does the faculty member grade it? And I think that's the wrong part of the course to be working with. Uh, what you really want to do is make it easier for the students to reduce the friction for the students. And if we believe that was the main thing, then we wouldn't have implemented course management systems. So one of the strengths of Blackboard, Moodle, and all those is that faculty could organize it any way they want because they have the academic freedom in their classroom. But what it meant that even though your campus may all be using Moodle, Blackboard, uh, Canvas, each class faculty member may use it differently. So one faculty member uses a threaded discussion, another faculty uses the Dropbox, another faculty uses the calendar. Uh, one of the things that we did on our campus was when Blackboard first came out, we turned on everybody, every faculty member's Blackboard course, but the faculty member had to populate it. There was one class where the they were doing something and the uh, uh, student asked for something and another student said, well, don't, don't worry about it. Um, it's on the Blackboard uh, section for this course. And the faculty member said, I'm not using Blackboard. And the student said, yeah, we know you aren't, but we are. Um, so what did that do? I said, oh, this is great. The students have figured out how to use this to make it work for them. And it didn't matter whether the faculty member used it or not. What came out of that? is in a big debate in the faculty senate, they turned it off. So rather than giving every course its own Blackboard site that the faculty could use or the students could use, unless the faculty member turned it on, it wasn't there. So wow. um, what I, I don't know, a, a plug, if, if you go on Amazon, you could buy a book called Documenting Learning, uh, written by my good friend, colleague, uh, Helen Chin, and, um, Tracy Penny Light. And the whole theme of this book is how do you document student learning? And things like a course management system or a portfolio system help you record and document and share learning. So when, when I was, quote, forced to use a course management system, I tried to turn it into, which probably confused my students, into a repository for their work. So it was a different mindset. I said, you're not using the course management system to turn an assignment into me. You're using the course management system to manage your course materials that you're working on in your work and you're inviting me in to look at it. So it shifted the ownership of what was happening to the student. And portfolio systems do that. It's the student's personal portfolio. You might have to prime the pump giving students assignments, you know, put in a resume, put in a sample of your work, but eventually you, you know, I want to see the students take ownership of documenting their learning. Because not only does that let them see their progress over time, it lets me have things to assess, but I'm not assessing it based on only what I think about it because they thought it was important enough to, to show that the document they're learning. And then later on, a lot of the times the students had the resources to be able to show this to a potential employer. I can't tell you how many times I've had a student who eventually would come, do you have a copy of the paper that I gave you? Because somebody wants to see something that I've written and I don't have a copy of it. So I think course management systems, if, if you would put the, you know, is this helping the student document their learning and is it removing the friction between the content and the resources for the student? Then I would love them, but most of the course management systems don't do that. Now, with Zoom and 
the the day in the Zoom Education Academy, they talked about Zoom apps, which were incorporating um, functionality into this on, online environment. They have things where you could keep notes, you could do clip um, uh, little pieces of a session. You, if I answered a question well, you as a student could record, you know, take that recording, put it into your notes. You could share that with another student. So um, I, I think there are tools that could be called a course management system or could be called a learning resource system or an object learning object system that could be useful. It just, we haven't designed or built those in to the level I think we need to. And Laura, you're raising your hand. Oh, you're just encouraging. She's, just, she's applauding what you're saying. Oh, okay, good. She's applauding what you're saying. Thank you, John, for that. Next question. Next question. So, Tony, if you'll allow me, um, um, may I may I bring in a question from YouTube? Absolutely. Okay, we have a question from Sky Gleason who says, "Creativity and imagination. How can we are how can we empower our audience slash students?" Um. One of the uh, challenges for students, I found her coming up with ideas, you know, the, the, the writer's block. Uh, so it, it's interesting, Sky would ask it because I, I have a theater background. I was never a performer. I would be a horrible performer, but I did tech theater. And um, you know, there's a lot of creativity in the theater space. And there's a lot of creative, creative people. Um, I, I think I found with students that you had to give them time to create things that were um, a little bit off the wall. You had, you had, if if you can get an environment where no idea is a bad idea and no question is a stupid question, then you'll get more creativity. But if the students feel that the question they might ask is gonna be considered dumb or stupid or that there's a right answer, then you really shut down creativity. So it's, it's setting up a space where um, there's no right answer and there's no idea that's too crazy. And I did that by, I, I was known on campus for being somewhat crazy. Um, we're probably more than somewhat crazy. Uh, it, probably the, you know, typically a faculty member doesn't want to have their picture on this, on the campus newspaper, but at Chico, you know, I didn't mind being different. So as I said, Chico was a Northern California town, number one party school the year I arrived. I'd like to think I was part of that. Um, I was one of the few professors who always wore not a, a suit and tie, but a jacket and tie in class. So I always had the, the coat and tie on, even when I was teaching television production classes. I bought cheap polyester suit, suits because I was always ripping something on it. But so uh, I was that weird professor who wore a coat and tie. And that was just sort of my Midwestern upbringing. And I'd been at a R1 research institute and worked in a tech facility. So, you know, I was used to coat and tie. So the student newspaper, uh, we, we, the, our students had done a project. They did some public service announcements that had been broadcast. Actually, one of them was broadcast on NBC in San Francisco. So they were asking about the student project. And then the reporter sort of joking said, you know, you always have a suit and tie. Do you, do you always wear a coat and tie? And I said, no, when I go to bed, I only wear the tie. And <laughs> that's the picture. And I mean, not the picture of me only wearing the tie, but that was the quote that made the student newspaper. So, I mean, I think creativity happens when you give people permission to be creative. And it's how you give that permission that makes the difference. And that, that the exercise I talked about um, with the crayons and the papers and the scissors, that set the tone of creativity. It, it also pointed out 
to the students that when you work in a medium that's not yours, particularly graduate students who by this time they've been, we were very formal and we write and you know we know our arguments. When you make them work with a communication tool they're not used to and they're not necessarily good at, they have to become creative. And so I think it's getting those experiences that let creative creativity come out. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that. We have any, any more YouTube questions? No more YouTube questions. Uh, okay. We have another question from Tony Mobley. Okay. What are your suggestions for professional development for educators? No, I think we did so that. We already did that. Yeah. Oh, I'm so yeah, sorry. Next question is from Liberty White. <laughs> um, what is your biggest learning from the Sea Day Project? I think you're, if you're talking the World Ocean Day, um, I think the it's interesting. The uh, director of the ports project uh, looks at me as sort of the tech guy, and he's always constantly, um, you know, saying, "John, I know you're the tech guy, and you want the audio and the video to be good and good lighting and stuff." He said, "But the most important thing is that our interpreters do it and the kids hear it. And as long as you got that level, you know, as long as that happens, it's all good. But we, we sort of upped the game sort of office hour style and our ocean day event where we had people coming in remotely. We had some bandwidth issues, but we had people from five different parts. We had divers in the, in the, uh, in the water and we had really good audio and video. And uh, Brad, who said, okay, now I understand that little extra production quality makes a difference. And we see that here as, I mean, I'm looking, we've all got good video. We've all got good audio. I was listening to Zoom Academy today and I'm, I'm going, this was good, but they didn't have this consistency of audio and video quality <laughs> that we have here. And you sort of, it, it wasn't that bad, but at certain points it was, you know, it's like this scratching on a chalkboard, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. So that was probably the, the best learning experience for me. And Brad was that, um, you know, he realized that upping the game doesn't hurt. Uh, but I learned that upping the game is a challenge. I mean, I think all of us who have done this, you know, it, it's, I, I worked with our teacher credentialing program for a long time. And for the longest time I was trying to get them to do green screens or do, and the, and the faculty members, you know, resisted it because it took extra time to put up a green screen. It took extra time to connect a microphone. And so it's, how do you get people to take that extra time? And uh, so I'm trying to figure out how to make it. So it's not as hard for our interpreters to get that extra level of quality and Brad's, you know, being saying, okay, we maybe need to give them the resources and the time. So we're buying some more microphones for, we're not making him doing as many presentations in a day, but the, the best, the, the lesson there was the, how do you reach the quality level, increase the quality level of the events, but also how do you do it without killing your, your participants? And, We've, I think we've been able to manage that within uh, your conversations program here and with the office hours in general. But that, that was the lesson learned for me. We're going to have uh, Chris and then Laura. I'm just going to comment that we are spoiled by our office hours experience. We don't accept good enough as good enough anymore. Yeah, Chris, I and... and it, it to be, you know, Alex has talked about it. We said how, you know, he still gets on calls and people go, how do you do it? And I, I get on calls and people go, how do you do it? And, and what did you, how do you get it to look like stained glass behind you? And, and um, I'm, you know, at the beginning it was okay. We know it because we were in this field, we worked at it. We had probably some of the best minds and technologists, but we're 450 days later, there's lots of stuff out there it would not be that hard for a lot of people to have their stuff look as good as this. And Absolutely. It's just not happening. Yeah. Laura. 
just a quick observation from the Zoom Academy today. Um, I noticed that their virtual backgrounds were pretty good, but I still am not a fan of the virtual backgrounds. Um, they didn't flicker like most do that I see, but still, it was not, it just didn't feel authentic. I just kind of hope maybe you could comment on what you thought of the, the ones well, with the actual Zoom with the presenter's name and all that on them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the fact that you can have a virtual background and particularly in terms of equity that that you could have a student could not have to worry what's what's behind them. Um, but even with a powerful machine and everything working right, it doesn't quite, you know, do it. And and particularly when you do have those distortions uh, and the images around the edge, it, it's it's a noise level. It would be like audio noise. So I think we we don't tolerate um, audio noise very well. We probably shouldn't tolerate visual noise very well. But there are things that you can do in terms of lighting and doing things. And I think it's only only going to get better. But if you can get a, a solid color, it doesn't have to be green as much, but if you get a solid color behind you and tell Zoom that you're using that and you can pick that color, you can fix it so that you, know, you don't have that artifact. But I, I have to admit, I'm in my downstairs studio, which was the one my son used when he was you know, surviving down here during the early days of, of the uh, crisis. But my upstairs room, I have a green screen because the, the room's messy. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that a clean office is a sign of a dirty mind and I'm almost pristine because my office is just a disaster. Um, but during the after show, I, I, you know, I guess I'm going to go downstairs where I don't do a virtual background, but you know, it, it was better than most the, the virtual background technology this year was better than last year's, but I'm, I'm not quite as anti green screen as some people are, but if in fact you do a virtual background without a green screen and you can see it's not working, you should just turn it off. Absolutely. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, next question. Doug Mueller comes in with, um, who do you think the future, I'm sorry, what do you think the future holds for the learning community once today's technology is the norm? Um, I think it's going to be good for the learning community when the Today's technology is a norm. Uh, my uh, my grandfather, who uh, was a clerk for the law firm that uh, did the contract for the first subway in New York, and one of the stories that he uh, told me was that he got to ride on the day that they did the first subway. He was only a clerk, but um, one of the lawyers said, "Are you going to?" ride the subway today. And my grandfather said, no, because I don't have a top hat. And this lawyer said, I've been in that damn tunnel so many times and tossed in the top hat. And he rode on the first mile and a half of the subway that they, that they opened it. And this was on a day when we were in the seventies in the subways and the subways were crazy. I mean, they were all over the place. And, and I couldn't imagine a New York without this subway system. And he understood what it was like before they had it. So I'm not sure what the, the what is the norm. You know, uh, one of the photos that I have that I gave to my uh, kids, we did a montage. And one of the photos of, is me in a phone booth. And for them, that's a very strange, strange thing. Um, you know, it, it makes, it's hard. I, I think about my grandfather, about how hard it would be for him when we were on the subways in the seventies for him when whatever 18 or 19, whenever, whenever he did the first subway ride. Um, the idea that you always have a phone with you and you could look at it. Um, you know, that's, it's, if, what is it? If, if it, if it was invented after you were born, 
it's magic or it's not magic. I forget forget the quote, but uh, but uh, the um, I think the learning communities are probably going to do well because the technologies do help communities learn. But not a, not my most articulate answer. I see what a great answer. Question. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Next question. Uh, the next question is from Guy Cochran. What's your proudest achievement and how can that help others? Um, I, <laughs> I'm not sure what I've achieved. I think uh, the fact that I'm still alive is a, is a good achievement. Um, and despite my shortcomings, I don't think I've damaged other people either uh, physically or mentally. Although my daughter may claim that the hours I had her come with me to Radio Shack is while she'll need therapy when she gets older. Um, I, I think the, the academic project that I'm the proudest of was the teacher credentialing program that we did, which was a statewide teacher credentialing program when there was um, class size reduction in California. And in a very short period of time, we created a online, well, actually site supported the, the emergency credential teachers were in schools because they needed them because they didn't have enough credential teachers. And we provided the instruction remotely, bringing the faculty to their classroom. And we created a team that we became an Apple Distinguished School. We created um, a, a number of uh, awards for success. And uh, so it's not my achievement, but it was the fact that we had this team that very quickly produced out of nothing, you know, a, a curriculum that served a thousand teachers a year for about five or 10 years, the numbers have gone down. But uh, so I, I think um, there was a project that we, we did with the National Science Foundation. There was a project we did with CNN Classroom. I think my greatest, uh, my greatest achievements are tied to my students' success in projects that we took on as a class. And uh, I think the greatest compliment that I got was uh, a faculty member who was you know, commenting on how, how amazed he thought it was that I would take on so many risks. And I had explained to him that actually when you empower your students to do projects that are slightly beyond your, their grasp, it's not a risk. I've never been disappointed. And that's, you know, some of the proudest achievements that I've had. Wow. Thank you, John. Next question. Next question is from Tony Mobley. What is the current state of diversity in education, in your opinion? Uh, it's not diverse enough. Um, I, I, there's lots of different reasons for that, uh, some cultural, some institutional. Um, and I think this is one of the, the, the challenges that I have now is that uh, I'm retired now, failing it. Um, early in my career, a lot of my work was spent on doing what professors have to do, creating, writing books, doing projects, getting promoted, um, you know, doing your classes, community, you know, that I, I was part of the system and I was really realizing I was part of a system that was not designed to be inclusive or even when it said it was inclusive, it was not completely inclusive um so it's it's realizing with uh, the time that i have and the knowledge that i have what can i do to help deal with these um 
issues of equity and lack of diversity. And it's been a challenge uh, even with our office hours that we're not a terribly diverse group, but a lot of that is because of the industry and who gets attracted to that industry. Um, a lot of it may be man spanning. You know, here, here we just spent an hour listening to a white man with a gray beard, you know, sounding like he knows what he's talking about. Um, but he's talking to another black man too. Yeah. So yeah, isn't that important? It, it is, it is important. Um, and I think the, the, the challenge is, and it's, it's for society now. And clearly there's a lot of issues uh, and we try to stay off, stay out of politics, but um, it is dealing with conversations, you know, sort of putting a bow on it, Tony, and you and I, uh, you know, talking is that we need to have conversations that have greater diversity, but that's a start. But once you get beyond just having greater diversity, then we have to talk about how do we get greater equity. And in terms of the, the fairness lecture, uh, one of the more cynical cartoons that I, I saw was, wasn't it great when the railroad barons after they robbed you decided to put up libraries rather than to fly into space. Um, and you know, maybe the space race that uh, Musk and uh, Virgin and, and um, Amazon, maybe this is a good use of their money, but the discrepancy between their value and the needs of students around the world, how, how do you deal with that? And so um, the diversity of ideas, I think will help solve it, but to get to diversity, we have to get better equity. And, you know, Tony, uh, you probably could point out that there were probably lots of areas where I had privilege that you maybe didn't. And it's not, I, probably not my fault that I was born where I was and had a, you know, I have a learning disability. I'm dyslexic. If I didn't have parents who both had advanced degrees and were willing to fight for me, I would never have made it out of high school, less, you know, become a PhD. You know, I, I'm dyslexic. I have a spelling capability of a third grader, which proves that, you know, you could get a PhD and not know how to spell anything, not even spell PhD. I stay up at night and worry, is there a dog? Um, but it was that privilege that I had that got me into college, got me through college and all sorts of opportunities. As a professor, I ran into a lot of students who didn't have the privilege that I had and they did not benefit. And, um, you know, the, now, I, I wonder, was there more I could have done for those students? And I didn't do it then because I had the classes, had the faculty meetings, had the, this and other. Now that I have much more control of my time and resources, what can I personally do? And, and part of what I've done is at least, uh, as you know, Tony, I've tried to help you with your systems. I've tried to help others uh, mm -hmm. with Laura. Um, try to amplify her voice and needs, um, you know, do what I can to, to help with equity and diversity. But, um, you know. It, well, it, let me say this, John. I, I think it's important that it's said. So I get a lot of, uh, I have a lot of people talking to me about conversations. And, and I'll be frank and say that I have been encouraged to have more people who look like me. And it's probably not politically correct to say this, but I'm going to say it. And so um, I think with everything that has happened in the past in terms of diversity issues, equity issues, all of those things, they're, they're in place. They're, they're there. They exist. So 
with that being said, what do we do to try to break down those systems? And I think that one of the ways in which we do that is that we not move aside race, not move aside culture, not move, move aside class or equity, but try to have meaningful conversations that will begin to try to address those things. I think it's important and it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter that the conversation is authentic and that it tries to solve an issue. And that's, and that's what, that's what I want to do. That's what I'm, I, I see you, Laura. I'm, I, and I'll, I, I just wanted to say that I, I think that it's easy for me to say, well, when I first looked at office hours, I didn't see very many people that looked like me. That's but because none of us are as handsome as you are, Tony. But we'll, <laughs> we'll 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 accept that. But but in all seriousness, I, I saw the value. I saw the value of knowledge that was being shared. And I, and I'm going to say it this way: I took that knowledge, and I shared it with a small religious community. I was able to use that knowledge to help that community get better. And I hope that this conversation that we're having right now can help a larger conversation to get better. But it could have been easy for me to say, well, there's nobody on there that looks like me. I don't have the tools that they have. And so let me just walk away or let me not participate or that's way above my head. And so all of those things is, exist out there. And I'm not trying to say that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so great or anything like that, but I do think that we have to find a way to break down the things that separate us because if we don't do that, we're lost. And, you know, I'm not trying to get philosophical or religious, but I do think that if we don't find a way to actually talk to each other about the things that matter to each of us, then we're, we're not going to get anywhere. I, and I apologize. Laura, go ahead. Two points and I'll make them brief. John, I believe I may have found the quote that you were working on. I did pop it in chat with the reference. Number two, and it stopped me hey, if you. I'm having issue, if, if, if this is not correct to say here. But I would ask that when you talk about your parents and the privilege, your parents had the resources, whether that be cognitive, whether that be financial, to advocate for you. It does not take an advanced degree to advocate for a child. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll get off. No, no. I, I think that that's important. It, it was, it wasn't their degree, but uh, I think it was actually what motivated them is they knew my skill set, and the school I went to wanted to get me into shop and they wanted me to graduate with all my fingers. And so I think that was the highest motivation, but, and but Tony, I think one of the, the things I worry about, even even today, you know, it's it it's I thank you know all of you for spending this time listening to me. You know, this is amazing. I I can't even get my kids to listen to me for this long. So this is this is you know a great, great moment. But I don't think I solved all the world's problems and I'm not sure I'm the expert. So when Tony, when you talk, who, who are the faces that should be here? It's, um, I had an experience in the Navy. We had a collision at sea and, um, long involved story, but I'll try to make it short. 
I was the one who, under international rules of the road, we went to offer assistance to the other ship. And I got on this other ship, and the first thing I said, you know, I, I have a corpsman, I have an engineer, what can we do to help? Realizing that we just rammed them and put a 34-foot hole in the ship. Um, and nobody was hurt one broken arm, but anyway, that, that, that got me off the ship into the public relations for the Navy, which would be a story for another hour. But, you know, at that point I realized why would anybody want to listen to me? You know, here I am offering aid and we were the guys who just rammed into them. And I think sometimes you get the image when people ask me for advice on how to make things better. I go, I, I did the best I could while I was an academic and i I moved the bar a little bit, but there's probably other voices that have to be in this conversation. And, and so Tony, the, the, the more diversity of, of the people speaking, more people that look like you, Laura, the more people that you could bring in that are as articulate about expressing what we need to do to meet the needs of the different skill sets and learning capabilities that our students have, the more they're heard, the better off they are than listening to retired Great beard professors. They're locked. I just want I just want to say that I think there's another another side to the thinking here. And that is when we do not have another that we don't have a complete group. We don't have a quorum. We don't have the full conversation. We don't have the full view. And so I want to say, because I, I feel strongly about conversations with Tony Mobley, I want people to be feel welcome here and, and feel invited and, um, and come and speak to the conversation, speak in the conversation, be part of the conversation. Because I think it's really, really important, the conversations that we're having. If you think about the seven weeks that we've had that Tony has put together for us, they're, they're very much pulling our understandings and mentalities away from, from what we already knew. And that is incredibly important. And we need more of that. And we need to, we need to hear from you. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, I, 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 I really appreciate that. 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 The, the seven weeks were fun. I, I mean, I what, it was reluctantly that I agreed to do this, but I said, you know, how can I say no to this if I was willing to do Matt in the Kitchen? I mean, come on. You know. um, but it, it, well, Matt in the Kitchen I did because I got food that wasn't on my diet. So, Tony, you've got a high bar, bar to raise. But what I, is, you know, I'm not sure I could even listen to this hour of me or hour and 40 minutes or whatever it is. But I thoroughly enjoyed your other speakers because I had an hour, an hour and a half focus with that person, you know, Laura learning from you, Chris learning from you. And sometimes in the office hours thing, you know, Alex wants to show the move faster. Um, and, you know, I could tell sea stories and long things for a long time, so I don't want to go that long, but but having an extended conversation, uh, I was willing to do this because I, not that I think I'm that great to listen to for an hour, but I, I do have good jokes if you want to go for another 45. But I really enjoyed listening to Laura, listening to Chris, uh, listening to the woman from New York, and I'm blanking on her name. Emily. Emily. And uh, and so I, I, I think it's, it's probably good to give people a form because it, it is a diversity. We really do come from a, a, a very different backgrounds. And even though Chris and I are both, uh, I was going to say old academics, sorry, Chris, senior faculty members. Um, old, old Navy salts. The old, yeah, that's right. But you were, you were uh, under the water. I was surface guy. Um, but you really learn more when you get to deal with the edges of people. And if you only see the, you know, the narrow light beam, you're really missing out on the people. And this is a nice thing that you're doing, Tony, to let people see the edges, them to be rough or soft, soft, Chris. 
an idea occurred to me as, as we're processing this wonderful experience we've just had. And uh, it is that we, we may have uh, been too faithful in imitating the office hours model, which is grounded in questions and answers. Um, because there's another category of matters that we all face, and those are dilemmas. They're not problems that have a single answer, and if we can find the right expert, we can nail it and move on. Uh, these are issues that are, and the equity issue is a, a lovely example uh, where there isn't a single silver bullet or right answer that any expert has or can give us or that will work in every situation or for each one of us. So my proposal is we think about um, how we can incorporate um, discussing how, we, how our special guests in the future manage dilemmas, particular dilemmas that they've been faced with in their professional career, maybe reflectively. They're thinking from the point of view of retirement, looking back on a, a long career, uh, or they're right in the midst of wrestling with, with this dilemma. And let's teach each other or listen to each other about how we manage these so-called problems that aren't really uh, problems, but are um, you know, Jacob wrestling with the angel. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, I want, I, I want go ahead, John. That Tarlock, the, how do you get a wife who's not an opera fan to become one? I, that's my dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure we have any more questions. Do we have any more questions? But no, there's not on the all, sheet that I see. All we're right. All the questions. All right. So fantastic. John, again, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, uh, I, I hope I didn't sink the show. I mean, this is. No. Thank you. It, it, listen, what happened here was supposed to happen here. I am thankful. And I, I can tell by the smiles on the faces that I see that this was another great experience. So thank you so much. I want you to tell Miss Bobby. No, you, thank you don't you have so a choice much. here. I told her I, I was, she told me not to go on too long. So she's here to give me the hook. Miss Bobby. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing him with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Glad to see you all. He's coming to cocktail hour. <laughs> I'll be there in a second. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bobby. And I, I want to say uh, thank you so much, everyone, for, for, for being here. And I'm going to do my quick thanks and special thanks to the global, and I mean global, family and friends. My good friend, Dr. Hasma Gagar, is here again. I know it's 4 a.m., soon to be 5 a.m. his time. He's here again. Thank you so much, Hasma. Um, thank you, global family and friends. Thank you, Alice Lindsay and the Office Hours members. Thank you, DVE Store, who powers this Zoom webinar. VDO 360 webcam, 3, 3C, 4K, which I'm not using tonight, but I still promote them. And the reason, again, and I know this is redundant. The reason why I promote them is because they were giving cameras to teachers when there were no, te no, no cameras, no webcams for teachers. I'm looking into the camera as I've been instructed to do to say this because I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> I want to thank Mr. Ken Jordans of Elms Park so much for the conversation with Tony Mobley website that you all have had a chance to see. It's amazing. It's, it is an amazing tool. Thank you so much, Ken. And I just want to share with you guys next week, next week, Mr. Andy Carasuccio will be here, president 
of Liminal. He will be here next week. And he's going to talk about Zoom OSC, but that's not all. So you office hours heads understand there's going to be something different. You might want to tune in. So again, I want to thank you so much. And the last thing is I want to invite everyone who's on YouTube to consider coming into the webinar because we're actually going to have what I call a, a fellowship hour. And it was supposed to be, you know, another 30 minutes of just kind of winding down and just talking about whatever you guys need to talk about. But I'm going to say, if you want to come in and hang out for 15 or 20 minutes, please come on camera. We're going to release John. John has to make Miss Bobby happy. And um, so if you want to come in, come on camera. If you didn't, we're going to end the YouTube. And um, I think to lock, I 